I'm in uh, Austin, Texas in a loft apartment that we turned into a studio uh, to record some Chase Jarvis Lives for Creative Live. And um, and I had, we're between takes and there's a bunch of, well, there's lots of questions in the queue, but there are two that came up that I think are interesting and I want to answer them together. And if you're not sure what you just tuned into, this, uh, I'm Chase, and this is The Daily Creative. This is a show that I film a couple times a week, answering your questions. Uh, we've been, I don't know, we got 50 episodes in or so, and I appreciate you leaving your questions at 802-962-4357. Global community, lots and lots of people calling in and hopefully learning from this. It's, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna get into the questions. Okay, you ready? This one is from John. Ready? Play. Hi, Chase, it's uh, Fritz. Uh, nope, from not John. Friend, Hi, Fritz. Yep. My question is like, how to make Germany. photography and maybe videography as well a scalable business? You know, um, I was I'm already currently working uh, paid by the hour, but on the long term, you know, I want to make um, um, a good business model out of it, so I'm not so demanded on filling my work schedule. Okay. So, what's your best approach to that? Um, thank you, Fritz. I'm sorry for calling you John before the things start rolling. I flipped the two questions. Uh, Fritz, great question. And that, in case you are wondering what scale means, um, I don't think you should. I think you should know what that means. But um, the challenge with being a photographer, if you, in terms of challenge with doing anything when you work for your time, it's um, then you only have so much time. So the amount of money that you can make is is basically limited by time. The way you would change that is you would charge a lot more per hour. And that is actually, there's a little fraction of that that is gonna be in my answer. But by and large, I see people botch this all the time. Um, and they botch it on both directions. They think that they try and scale before they're ready to scale. And sometimes the best answer is not to scale. Um, but in this particular uh, situation, I just wanna talk you at a time, at a trading your time for money. Okay, so whether you truly scale in the like, you take one picture and then you sell it, instead of like one time, you sell it a thousand times, which would be like, for example, stock photography. Like, I think that's an example of how you make your work scale. You take a picture and then you sell that same picture, or rather you license the rights to use that via a stock agent or on your own. Um, by and large, I think that the ability to make real money unless you dedicate your entire life to that focus. I think it's waned. There's, it's a lot of, a lot of images in the marketplace. I don't think it's not, not undoable. You can do that. That is technically a way to scale. Again, taking one picture and using computers to market that picture and get a lot of transactions at a low price um, and make some good money. So that's one way. Um, I think th there's, a, there's a handful of other ways, but I, and I'm going to give you a couple more, and then I'm going to sew it up at the end here, and I'm going to tell you what I actually think. So another way is to um, train people in your methods and um, take a piece of their business as they go off and make yours, and you can help. You can create a community. Um, I think my friend Peter Hurley, he's been on Creative Live uh, a bunch. He's got a, the headshot crew, and you can be a headshot photographer taught by Peter, and then Peter goes out, and then I think you pay a chunk of your money to him, and he helps market your business and whatnot. That's kind of interesting. That's a way you can take what you do, train people in your methods, and then they can contribute to your wealth. Um, and if you can get potentially you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of people doing that, you can see how that would, be, that would really contribute. So that's another way. What that requires is that you actually do something and own it in a way that's like, oh wow, that's the fill in the blank method. Um, you see that with like Bikram Yoga or um, CrossFit is an affiliate, basically. You use the name, you pay a licensing fee to them, and then you're sort of certified as a fill in the blank. So you can do that in photography. Um, another thing you can do to scale your business in photography is, this is not, this is not true scale, but like by the technical term, or I think of it in technology as, as scaling, but you can charge exorbitant fees. You can develop your brand over time such that hey, there's only so many days, and so in order to access me or to hire me, you have to pay a high fee, and then the, the number of people who are willing to pay that fee get to, you know, there, there are fewer and fewer, but if you're booked all the time, then you can just continue to raise your prices. So that's not technically scaling. Um, and then you can also, um, as a photographer, you can build an online community, um, help you know add value back to others. You can sell digital goods uh, if you've made a brand that people recognize. 
and then you can make one product and help computers and platforms and other online technologies to sell at scale. For, you know, if you get your SEO juice really up or, or you are on Creative Live, for example, there's a whole team of people who are targeted at marketing your stuff. That is, I'm trying to, that's not, again, technically scaling your photography business, but that's a way, again, to use computers and algorithms and, and whatnot to reach more people than you could reach as what people classically think of as a photographer. That's why I know that that's buried in your question of scaling. So those are a handful of methods, and I, there, are, there is no right answer for this. Those are some things, and there's probably a couple of others, but what I want you to think about, and this is to me the most important thing, this is the takeaway, is whatever you do, you should do with intention. And in, in order to find out what you intend or I intend to you know, build this particular thing, you just don't want to stumble into that accidentally. I watch people do that all the time. They just sort of like bumble around and they end up like, oh, here I am. I guess this is how I make a, make a living because I, I see Larry doing it or Sally doing it or whatever. I would rather you say, what parts of the business do I love? And when you find out that thing, how can you build a business around it? So for, I'll just use myself as an example, I loved being a, an amazing craftsperson and being able to make a vision come to life. And I wanted to do that for the world's top brands, the Apples, the Nikes, um, you get it. And so over time, I was able to get hired by smaller and then larger and larger and larger companies such that I became known as the guy in my space and say outdoor sports, action photography, who when the stakes were really high, you called me to come in and make some amazing vision, usually with a large budget and some in a unique place with you know, interesting people to make this advertising campaign come to life in a way that an advertising agency or the brand or those two had come together to make that. Now, technically that is not scale, but that I was in that camp, I think number of the four that I listed, number three, where you can just charge very, very high prices for the work and you don't have to have like 500 clients to have a successful year. You could have 10 or 15 or 20, 20 big gigs or 30 big gigs and make a enormous sum of money. And the cool thing about that is I think if you, if you plan and do that well, um, again, this is just my, my particular bias, if you enjoy sort of hunting the particular picture and doing something amazing with a bunch of people where you're committed and doing a thing, I love that. It's like the, the journey, the hunter, the story, the narrative, all that, I love it. For me, processes like taking stock photography pictures and like think of what, what is, the, girl with pencil, girl with pencil in white shirt, girl with pencil in black shirt, tall girl with uh, brown hair and graduation cap, or, you know, all these, um, just like a volume process where you're checking off, do I have that picture, do I have that picture, et cetera. I hate that. To me, that is, that's the commodification or commoditization of a product that I loved, so I didn't like it conceptually. That's not to say I didn't participate in it. I did use some agencies, sometimes under my name, sometimes not, to license my pictures, but they were the thirds and fours and the extras that I had rights to and wasn't going to do anything with. They were gonna go in the garbage or I, I uh, license them out. So you can do both of these things at the same time. I think that's kind of an interesting deal. And if you look at any, excuse me, contemporary photographer who's a total badass right now, they will uh, by and large have many pieces to their business. So I, I'm, I, I realize I'm opening a bigger can of worms than you asked, but I think this is where the true value comes into you asking a question. And the rest of you folks who are not Fritz, who are listening, you're going like, oh damn. And this applies to photographers, designers, filmmakers, um, just freelancers in general, I think. So have different pieces of your business make different kinds of money for you. Some passive income, like stock photography sales, I'm just dropping everything. Um, and some very, very active, that high touch, high dollar, um, that, you know, the custom ad campaign stuff that I was talking about earlier. A lot of people on the side teach. Uh, for me, you know, my community turned into, in part, um, blossomed and grew Creative Live, which is a worldwide education platform that you know about where we've now got 10 million students on that platform. So like conceptually, you can be involved in lots of different things and have different sorts of income coming into one photography or fill in the blank uh, freelance business. That's what I think you should do. I think you should, you should focus 
most of the business on the thing that you care deeply about, uh, charge your premium, be a premium product for that, and then have some ancillary things on the side that are fun and interesting. And again, don't do shit that you don't love um, because you can get sucked into that, and especially if it pays well but you don't love it, that's the, a quick, quick road to a slow death. Just think about that one for a second. <laughs> um, okay, well, Fritz, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think it's a popular question, especially as freelancers, we're trying to make money whatever we can, in whatever way we can. You can also sell prints, fine art. You get to see, you can just build this robust, it's like a solar system with a bunch of different um, planets going around, you as the primary creator. That's not to say you can't do it all the other ways, the other ways I was talking about, but I like that. So, there you go, Fritz. That's question number one today, and question number two here, because we've got to record Another session here in just a second. Uh, hurry, hurry. This is going to be good. All right. Hey, Chase. So my name is Bobby Burton. I'm Bobby Burton. And my question Arkansas. to you today is being creative, my brain, my thoughts, it's always all over the place. Uh, also, I'm pretty talented in that I can do anything I put my mind to. But at the same time, it's a curse because I end up getting distracted and I'm all over the place. So question to you is, what do you do to keep your projects limited to where you can stay on course or, you know, if you have a set goal to where you stay on that path until that job is completed instead of having a bunch of open projects all going at once. Got it. Um, my website's www.fstophangout.com. I appreciate your time. F-Stop Hangout. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bobby Burton. So, um, if what you're talking about, Bobby, and, you know, I'm just going to call it, if what you're talking about is ADD or ADHD, uh, I think you should see a doctor, make some choices. You don't have to go on medication. There are lots of things you can do like meditation, um, medication, just like making an active choice if, if, if that's a real thing. I don't think I've ever been technically diagnosed or I know I've never been technically diagnosed. I think I have different piece, pieces and parts of my life have, um, I've felt a tendency about that, like a really fast mind and that sometimes is helpful and sometimes it's really harmful. And I'm listening to your question and what I'm hearing you say is that it's, it sounds like it can be harmful to you. So ADD and ADHD medication, professional support aside, um, just a couple of, of coping tools. I really, I think being goal oriented is a very good way to um, mitigate the desire to go all over the place. A couple, you know, a couple of very specific goals. Now, it may be a project. It may be, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm just an advocate of deciding what you want to do. Make a list of those things and focus on the fewest number of things you can so that you have the most chance of achieving that goal because that's really what a goal is or a habit, right? It's like making the goal the habit for the day. Wake up and what can I do to move this thing forward? Um, and I, I believe that just the, the, that, that act of deciding that you're going to do something and then applying daily actions towards that is a really good way of, um, of staying on task. Now, a couple other little hacks. I think I've got some hacks on how to use my time. Do you remember what that video is called, Nasa? The, how to get shit done. Uh, I think it's called How I Get Shit Done. And I think maybe it says literally, How I Literally Get Shit Done. Um, and that's a way of organizing my time. You should check out that on YouTube. Um, in, in short, it's about chunking or putting blocks of like items together. Like I have to make 10 phone calls today. I'll put all my phone calls together. I have to do this really deep, you know, deep element of research. I'm writing a new book or I'm concepting a new, uh, a new film or I'm working on some um, storyboards or whatever. And that could take... Uh, longer time and so I block out 90 minutes or sometimes even three hour chunks to get really deep meaningful strategic thinking done because you can't try and do deep strategic thinking in five or ten minutes it's just it's fiction so um, I think go check out that video um, also it sounds counterintuitive I don't know the science behind this but um, reportedly or reputedly I'm not sure which is the right word to use there I don't know why I'm thinking this right now but it actually can be helpful if you have a couple of different projects going at the same time. I've heard that the number is either three or I've heard five. Doesn't matter, just not that many. And there are ways that you can apply yourself, push, 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 push until you hit a blocker and you're not getting a lot done. 
and move to the next one. Now, it's not, notice it's not an unlimited number of things. It's not like 50, because then you're never getting to get anything done. That's like trying to boil the ocean. But if you can bounce around by, with a couple of projects and you're working on this thing and you get some ideas and you can, and then, oh, wow, I'm going to pick, I'm blocked over here, but I'm going to pick this project up. And in, in some cases, this is a portfolio shoot. Uh, in other cases, this is like putting your email list together, a list of clients. In other case, it's, you know, designing um, next year's marketing materials or, you know, you, and you just got a couple of things that you're working on. You're going to move each of those things together sort of in sync as you're inspired by each of them. That only works if you can narrow the set of things that you're working on. So um, ultimately, I'm an advocate of writing things down. And if you get lost, like, oh, I'm, and you think like, oh, should I be like, doing this right now? Is this the best use of my time? Go back and look at the plan that you made to do A, B, C, and D. And if the thing that you're doing now is not, does not help A, B, C, or D, then you're doing the wrong thing. Wrong is maybe not the right word. You're not, you're not really allocating time against the things that you said when you are clear-headed or important to you. So some of this stuff is productivity hacks. Uh, one of my favorite productivity folks or person out there is Tim Ferriss. He does a really good job. Um, don't think you're going to get away with the four-hour work week. That's not how it works. Um, but you know, he and I have talked a lot. If you Google my name and his name, I gave you that other video. I think all of those are helpful. Now I'm going to also, as I like to do sometimes, put a bow on this at the end, and that is, if, what, if you're trying to work with some brain chemistry stuff that you have going on, it's going to be some combination of all these things that I've talked about. Maybe some medication, maybe, like, it's really understanding how you work. So what can you do to listen to your body and, and basically pay attention, deconstruct the way you work and the way you think, and then how can you build systems that address it and help you be successful? I think systems are the answer as I spent so much of my life, or especially early on in my career, rather as a creator, just like, I don't want to schedule, man. I don't want the man to keep me down. It's like, and yet, as soon as I put some systems in place and or some schedules, like I want to focus on this and this in this time period or in this week, I'm going to you know, knock out next year's marketing materials. As soon as I started having some fundamental things that I did on some interview that or interval that worked for me, I found that the time in between those regimented scheduled moments was very valuable and very rich and very creative. So by parking the shit that you have to do or goals that you have, by parking them on your calendar and sticking to it, that allowed the time where I wasn't doing those tasks to be wildly creative. And it has a different, it has almost the exact opposite effect that you think it was. You think scheduling something is gonna keep you down, when it actually, it enforces discipline, it supports you in the things that you have to do and will create more time for the things that you want to do. The, the big dreamy stuff. So, uh, Bobby, I hope that helps. Um, thanks for calling in from Nebraska. Again, I'm Chase. Uh, thank you for sharing this. If you think, if you've got any value out of it, a little bit of share here and there, um, thumbs up, all that stuff is valuable. I enjoy it. But more than anything, it's hoping to have you find a way to forward this to help other people in your community because the people who I know, they know me, we have a great relationship, we make shit happen. Um, if you can share this outside into your community, that would mean the world to me. Arigato gozaimasu. Um, again, if you want your question on the show, it's pretty easy. I do these things a couple times a week, randomly when I have 15 minutes like I did here. And the number is 802-962-4357. And every once in a while, I call you back if you want to be called back. And we, we will prearrange it. Don't worry about that. I don't want to call, you know, create anxiety here. But there you go. That's it. That's for another show. Is that it? Can we, is that, are we good? All right. Time to go. Signing out from Austin, Texas. I'm Chase. I'll see you next time.